It's great to see so many of you here tonight in what is the second in our series of the Policy Cycle Club. Tonight looking at the issue of uh, academic selection in schools. <coughs> I want to say a word of thanks just before we start to talk politics to our sponsor on this on each of our other policy and fight of events. I just run very quickly through um, how things are going to work. Um, we have got four great speakers here tonight. Um, Greg Brady, uh, Elizabeth Trust, Lord Blackwell and Fiona Miller. They're going to speak in that order. Each speaker will get five minutes either to propose or oppose the motion. During, those, during their speeches, um, they will take points of order from the floor if they wish, but that's their prerogative. So if you have a point of information or something you wish to interject with, put your hand up and if they respond to you, then away you go. But they, they can't choose to ignore you. Um, the, the, the then will be a period when each speaker will be allowed to respond um, to each other in a, in a rebuttal session, and then um, we'll invite audience participation. Can I ask you to keep your participation to sort of the form of uh, either a short statement or a question? Keep it short, keep it sweet. If it's not, I will basically tell you to sit down. Um, so, first off, we are going to vote at this point uh, on the motion. So, the motion is Is a return to academic selection in schools inevitable? If you think it is inevitable, please hold up your green card number. I don't know if there's any yet, but post the government of the other house is counting all of these, but that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I guess the first platter is. And those who are against it? Sorry? There's a difference between the inevitable and yeah. do you support it? There is. Do you oppose? Do you, are you for the motion or are you against the motion? <laughs> relatively, relatively few. Okay, at that point I'll call on Graham to open and um, to want to propose the motion. Excuse me. Please do, yes. Yeah. Well, thank you very much Mr Chairman. It's always a pleasure and reassuring to begin this subject uh, with a chairman uh, with the accent that you have, uh, because as everybody in the room will know, uh, Northern Ireland has a selective education system and gets the best results typically in the United Kingdom uh, year after year. Uh, five minutes <laughs> on is uh, selection, return to selection inevitable in schools, uh, and uh, broadly five points. Uh, first of all, uh, yes, uh, because it's already happening, uh, as the key way of trying to improve standards, raise output even in comprehensive schools, the government is turning to streaming and setting, uh, selecting pupils by ability, teaching them in ability groups. That is one of the government's prescriptions, even while it persists in resisting a return to more uh, selective uh, schools. Uh, in the meantime, if we're not to have selection by ability, uh, we continue to face the uh, miserable uh, facts that we've grown accustomed to over the last 40 years or so of selection by house price, the ability of parents to buy uh, property within the catchment of a better, more middle class, comprehensive school. And of course even the new Labour government accepted that it was necessary to, in order to raise standards, uh, to allow selection by aptitude. And I remember well, going all the way back to the School Standards and Framework Bill in 1998, uh, my uh, esteemed <coughs> colleague Stephen Dorrell uh, opening the Oxford English Dictionary and saying, and what is the definition of aptitude? And the first word uh, was ability. Uh, the second point is that the government is already expanding the existing grammar schools. Uh, we have a policy from Michael Gove, which is entirely welcome, that allows grammar schools to expand where there is demand, not just within their <coughs> existing properties and premises, uh, but even into other sites. And I hope and expect that that will happen uh, before uh, too long. The second thing, we don't have time uh, to go through all of the evidence for higher academic attainment, not just in grammar schools, but crucially in selective areas as a whole. But year after year, it is the selective LEAs which outperform the comprehensive LEAs. Governments cannot <coughs> resist the facts of that uh, indefinitely. Uh, and 
however you look at it, however you cut it, you find that selection raises standards in the grammar schools and in the other schools. And fascinatingly, uh, even now we have evidence that shows that every ethnic minority group in the country performs better in selective LEA areas than in comprehensive ones. Um, fourthly, I, I would just come to the point of popularity. This is an argument that I've been having all my life since I was a boy at Oldham Grammar School. I'm wearing the cufflinks today. And uh, it's an argument that we won in Oldham. It's an argument we have won in the borough of traffic. We won it not only in the new body of any party at the last general election in my constituency. None of the four candidates opposed the grammar school system. Uh, but also, I would say, the attitudes taken by the new Labour government in 1997, whereby it expressly decided to remove the whole question of the future of grammar schools uh, from local authorities uh, and said that it must be given directly to parents to vote. And the reason was uh, so that Labour was able to win metropolitan authorities like mine in the Borough of Trafford, which it could never do uh, if the Labour Party was able to threaten the closure of the grammar schools. We know the popularity of grammar schools and selection. The one ballot which has been held in Ripon, the parents who were opposed to uh, destroying the grammar school won by a majority of 75 or 80 percent, and there hasn't been another ballot since. And I close with uh, what I think is probably the most important point. Given the immense popularity of grammar schools, given the evidence that they work so well, given that we know that this is something that parents want, and given a world in which, supposedly, all the political parties now believe that parents should have some choice in the kind of schools that their children should be able to attend. It is simply untenable for government to continue saying we will allow policies which extend parental choice, which allow you to have new schools, free schools, academies, uh, as long as they're only the kind of schools that we think are acceptable. If governments are serious, about really opening up choice to parents, if they will give the freedom to parents to choose the kind of schools they want, then a return to selection is the Thank you, thank you, Graham. And I now call on Elizabeth. Thank you. Anthony Crossland famously said, I'm going to destroy every effing grammar school in the country and unleashed a tide of wrong thinking about education, including mixed ability classes denigration of traditional academic subjects and child-centred learning. Now, there are other systems in the world, such as Canada, <coughs> who manage to have comprehensive schools that don't have that other associated wrong thinking. And I think what we have in Britain is a huge culture problem. I saw this myself. I went to a comprehensive school in Leeds, <coughs> and, was comprehensive, and I saw a complete failure to raise the aspirations of a lot of students at that school to get um, them studying the academic subjects and to get them into the top universities. And I'm certainly not saying that we should get rid of successful grammar schools. And I agree with what Graham says that the top ten local of the top ten local authorities in terms of those studying rig rigorous academic subjects, nine of them are grammar school authorities. So you're absolutely right about the evidence. I think though that the big task we face as a nation is dealing with our national culture that extols celebrities and belittles geeks. And subjects like maths and science and languages are seen as not as desirable as they are in countries like China and India, where people are studying those subjects and getting ahead. And what my concern is, is we live now in a very different environment from the 1950s. We've had huge technical change. We now need a lot more high-skilled people. If you look at a farm you know, 40 years ago, they, they needed lots of manual workers. Now they need an eighth of the number of staff, but those staff have to be much better qualified and much better trained. And if we look at countries like Japan, 95% of students there go on to study A-level equivalents and do well at them. And I don't think we can accept our current level of skills preparation. This is not to say I don't support any selection in schools, and I think the motion is that uh, I think people are struggling with exactly how to debate on. But I do think we need to shift our culture first. If we simply went back to an 11 plus across the country, 
without dealing with the problems in our education establishment, then we would end up with sink schools, in my opinion. And I think too often the debate in Britain focuses on the natural ability of the student, and those on the left seek mixed banding, and those on the right seek selection. But the most successful systems are those that focus on hard work. And systems like Canada and Germany, what they do is they help hold back students who don't achieve a grade each year, or they accelerate students through courses who work hard. And if you look at the outperformance of Asian students in this country, it's because they come from cultures that really encourage them and say, it doesn't matter where you start from, if you work hard, you will do well. And I think we need to get that kind of culture in our country. And I've met student teachers who come over from Canada and Australia, and what they say to me is that the students here are less motivated, they tend to forget what they've learnt because they believe there's a kind of determinist attitude that they'll finish up where they started, and I think that's wrong. And the results speak for themselves. We're 28th in the world in maths, 16th for science, 25th for reading. I think it's absolutely appalling. We have too few students that do core subjects. We have the smallest proportion of 16 to 18 year olds studying maths of any country in the OECD. And I think it's disgraceful and it can't continue and we need action that's going to raise the standard of every student in every school. I favour a direction of dictating more of the core in state schools like they do in Germany and Canada. I noticed that countries like Sweden abolished media studies at A level in 2011. Why are we teaching subjects that are not delivering the same value in our schools and paying state money over to do that? And the problem hugely exacerbates social mobility issues. If you are at a comprehensive school, you are seven times more likely to do media studies A level than if you are at a private school. And if you're at a private school, you're twice as likely to study science or maths A level. This, the, the subject choice is a massive problem. I think we've also seen the content of subjects diluted. I don't have time uh, to go into that at this stage. I think the government is doing a lot of good things in terms of teaching reform, in terms of academies and free schools. I want to see the 2013 curriculum really focus on core learning that all students need. And I'd like to see an ABAC of rigorous academic subjects in addition to the EBAC so that bright students from all backgrounds have a pathway through school. I'd also like to see us look at holding back students who don't perform. Now people draw comments to close. Ah, excellent. Um, I think we need to address that culture and then we need to look at schools having more choice over their pupils. But essentially, I want a system where students choose their schools rather than one where schools choose their students. And I think that's the way we look at it. It's the schools and teachers of motivation that need to improve first. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I know Colin Lord uh, Blackwell is <coughs> Thank you. Well, this, this is going to be a very polite debate because I agree with uh, a lot of what Elizabeth said. Um, and there is an important issue which is raising educational standards across the board, which is very important. Uh, and the majority of children, by definition, are somewhere in the middle of the ability range, and selection wouldn't necessarily be the answer to them. They need the kind of things that Elizabeth was talking about. But I think it is important that we worry about the people at the bottom end of the ability range and the people at the top end of the ability range. Uh, and I think for those, academic selection is not only educational common sense, but it is very important for social equity. Um, as Graham said, it is in fact already widespread, despite decades of uh, admonition against selection in schools and favouring all ability groups. Uh, the latest statistics I've got are that in secondary schools, 71% of maths classes are setted or streamed. 58% uh, of English classes, 62% of science classes. Why are teachers doing that? Because actually it's the best way, most effective way, for them to teach children of varying ability. The idea that you could mix children up and teach the most able and the least able in the same class, frankly, belonged to the uh, left-wing theoreticians. Um, and there is a simple reason for this, that children do better in a peer group of people, of other children of similar ability. And there is academic evidence uh, to support that. that uh, and it's true whether you're talking about 
the special needs children at the bottom or the very able children at the top end of the distribution. Uh, but there's some research that shows if you take the top 5% of children at primary school and you follow them into either a grammar school or a comprehensive school, uh, there is significantly more of those children of similar ability get A and A star GCSEs if they go to a selective school than if they go to a comprehensive school. Uh, now that's not just because uh, grammar schools teach better, it's partly just that they benefit from being in a class with more children of comparable ability, challenging them and setting them in a peer group um, aspiration. So if, for example, you look at comprehensives, uh, those comprehensives which have more than 20 children in the top 5% ability range uh, do as well as grammar schools. Unfortunately, most comprehensive can't muster class sizes of 20 children of that ability range. And if you have 10 or fewer children in the top 5%, the evidence shows that they get half the number of a and style grades of children who are in larger classes. Um, now, an average comprehensive might have 200 people in a year, 5% of that is 10. So it's very hard for most comprehensives to muster the critical mass of children to have a class of the, that highest ability range. Um, and therefore, you know, I think it's educational common sense that for that group, as for the special needs group at the bottom, you want to have education that focuses on their needs. Uh, now maybe that schools, one idea I'd like to promote is for schools to club together uh, so that they can form a common fast stream for those ablest children. They need to be all selected schools, they can take children more ability, but within that, find the most able children, and just as they club together to have a Russian class very long, they can club to together to have a fast stream. But there's also a role, as Graham said, I think, for specialist academic schools that cover a wide area that take people from all social classes, all backgrounds, not just people who happen to live in their catchment area, uh, not in uh, necessarily selecting their pupils on a compulsory level plus, but taking those children who are motivated enough, because Elizabeth says motivation is important as attitude, motivated enough to want to apply and want to progress. And I think that is socially vitally important because we have closed off those levels of opportunity for the children from the poorest areas of our cities and the poorest strata of society who live in the wrong postcode uh, and don't get the opportunity to have the best education that their abilities and, and uh, motivation qualifies them for. And it's not only socially important that they should, uh, it's economically important because it's the top 5% or so of our population who will uh, provide a more than proportionate number of our leaders in business, academic, medicine, politics even. Uh, and at the moment, as we know, that top 5% uh, selected by Oxbridge and the career and the top careers is over-dominated by the private schools. Why is that? It's because uh, a large proportion of the able children, the top 5% around the country, are not able to get into a secondary school that gives them the quality of education that they deserve and the country needs. And if we throw away that proportion of resources of the most able children by not giving them the best education that they deserve, we're not only inflicting a social inequality that I can't justify on those children. But we are destroying for the country the chances of having a critical mass of high ability, high educated leaders of the future who economically we need to survive in the world. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call upon Fiona Miller to start the opposition. <clears throat> okay, well I'm going to start by um, demolishing a few of the myths about selective education. The first one is that grammar schools are good or better schools. They get better results, but they don't, that's not necessarily because they're better schools, they just take more able pupils. Some are very good schools, some are quite mediocre, and some don't add as much value to their pupils as neighbouring non-selective schools, including some in range constituency. The second myth is that dividing children by academic ability raises standards overall. It doesn't. The OECD, which is so beloved by uh, the sec current Secretary of State for Education, shows that on average, systems with greater levels of inclusion have better overall outcomes than less inequality. In the so-called golden age of selective education, 38, 1959, 38% of grammar school children failed to achieve more than three O-level passes. In 1959, <coughs> only 9% of 16-year-olds achieved five O-levels. Today, that figure is almost 70%. 
At the time, the Times agonised over a scandalous waste of talent in a system that consigned most pupils to secondary models. And a quick scroll down the DfE performance table shows that many non-selected authorities, including the one where my own children have been educated, outperform their selected neighbours. Uh, the latter containing disproportionate numbers of schools that fail to meet the government's new draw targets. Right. The third myth is that working class children are given the ladder out of poverty by grammar schools. This is based largely on the anecdotal life stories of individuals like Andrew Neal, Diane Abbott, and Michael Portillo, and other prominent public figures, without establishing how typical they were. Uh, in fact, in the golden age of grammar schools, the ma majority of children who passed the 11 plus came from the families of professional, managerial, and clerical workers. More than 40% of working class children who were in grammar schools left with no O levels. And today, the percentage of children in grammars from really prior backgrounds and children on free school meals is virtually non existent. Uh, as David Willits, Graham and Mrs. Colley pointed out in his speech to the CBI a few years ago, selection simply entrenches social segregation. He noted that wealthy parents can now distort the testing process for pay, for, by paying for private tuition. And Willits had also been convinced by research showing that able children from poorer backgrounds are overtaken by their less able but better off peers by the time they were five. The fourth myth we've, which we've heard today is that comprehensives have failed. This line is usually promoted by people who have never been in a comprehensive school, don't use them for their own children, or read the daily mail. <laughs> Most children are now educated in all ability schools, and around six times as many pupils get five good GCSEs than in 1968, and six times as many, as many go to university. And contrary to one of the best publicised myths, almost twice as many students go to Oxbridge from state school today as in 1961. According to the Robbins report, in 1961, 34% of state school pupils from uh, 37, uh, 34% of pupils in Oxford came from state schools and 27% from Cambridge. Today that figure is about between 55 and 60%. And this brings me back down to the real reason why grammar schools will never be introduced in much numbers. Because they rely on a system not of selection, but of rejection. Any party mad enough to try and do this, and only UKIP falls into that category at the moment will realise very quickly that they will need to explain to the majority of parents that their children will start their secondary school life as failures. They will need to explain that the majority of children will end up in secondary models with a disproportionate number of children on free school meals with special needs and without the critical mass of more able pupils that Norman rightly said that schools need to do well. They will have to tell their parents to forget about choice because schools will be doing the choosing and that children will be allocated a place based on a test which is widely accepted to have a significant margin of error. And they will need to explain that friendships, siblings, and communities will be divided by this test. Never forget that comprehensive schools came to be because the grammars were loathed and detested by middle-class parents who resented their children being stamped as failures at 11. And no politician in their right mind, least of all one who professes to care about the chances of poor children, would be able to argue that they should be brought back in large numbers. It is comprehensive systems, as Elizabeth says, like Finland or the Canadian province of Alberta, regularly hailed by the current Secretary of State as success stories that have no private sector, no selection, no streaming, and no segregating children into different school type that still outperform all the others across the world. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, perhaps this side of the house might like to rebut first, if there are any points that were raised. <laughs> well, let, let me pick up a couple and then do a better job. Um, firstly, the score mad that um, grammar schools only do well because they select rich kids. Uh, I mean, it's undoubtedly true that on the whole, more middle class children go to grammar schools than uh, middle class children. But, as I pointed out, there's a lot of educational evidence of why educating children in peer groups of people with similar ability raises standards. And uh, if, uh, if you give children from poor background a chance to go to a, a selective school, uh, that has to be better than a system where they're excluded on the grounds that they don't have enough money uh, or they can't afford to buy a house in a postcode with a good comprehensive school. And for the same reason saying they're not a ladder. Uh, you know, they may not be a ladder for everyone, but surely it's better to have a ladder that allows some children to climb up who've got the motivation and the aspiration to want to apply than to kick the ladder away because some 
it may benefit some children more than others. I mean, it's, it seems to me a very curious argument. Say, uh, because more middle class children go to grammar schools, they must be bad socially. At least they provided the ladder for those children that we've now destroyed. Yes, if you want. I just I wanted to come back on this whole issue about Canada and the culture in Britain because I think what happened when we adopted comprehensive education, we dropped it all this other stuff as well, like mixed ability teaching, child centered learning, the introduction of a lot of non subjects into our curriculum which Canada doesn't have, and Fiona mentioned Alberta. In Alberta, you study algebra, you, know, you, don't stu you, know, you don't study data handling, which is in the UK maths curriculum. Also, they have advanced courses for high achievers within Alberta schools. I actually spent a year at school in British Columbia in Canada, and the whole attitude is completely different. You can be held back if you don't perform. There's much more focus on the pupil's motivation. And I think in Britain we've got the kind of, we ended up with the worst kind of comprehensive system. So it's very difficult to, to directly compare other countries with different cultures. And my, my fear about the, 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 the British culture and the way comprehensive systems were introduced is we introduced every possible bad education philosophy at the same time as introducing comprehensive schools. And I think we need to address that. I mean, I did agree with Norman's point about the top and bottom performers. And indeed, I've recently supported a free school opening, which will just have the bottom 20% in Thetford in, in my constituency, because uh, they want to focus on special needs students, rather than learning um, problems, who, who might be focused on. So I think there is a role for specialist schools to create, to deal with special groups of people, but also representing a rural constituency. I recognise you can't get the critical mass and the idea that people are going to get on a bus to Norwich or you know, Kings Lynn to go to grammar school is difficult and not everybody will do it. So I think my slight challenge to Norman really is if we just focus on selection as the problem, we're not addressing a lot of the issues within schools, which is poor teaching standards, low levels of teacher qualification, you know, failure to get rid of bad teachers. I mean, there's an appalling statistic for how many failed teachers have actually left schools in, in the last 30 years. So I think my view is the education debate has sometimes focused on, it, on selection at, at the expense of other issues uh, which need to be addressed. Great. Yeah. Liz, this is no way to have a fight. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're in danger of agreeing with, with everything you say. Delighted to you support the open and use of academic and selective school in your constituency, we'll be specialising in those of uh, lower academic ability. That is part of my argument. And picking up uh, Fiona's uh, myths about selection in grammar schools, they may be myths about selection, uh, but they weren't necessarily myths uh, that were contained in my argument. And she, uh, in particular, said that you can get higher value added in a high school, what we used to call a second modern school, in my constituency than in a grammar school. That's right. Actually, the secondary modern schools in my constituency are all outstanding schools that achieve remarkable results and typically do better than the comprehensive schools in Leafy and Cheshire next door. Uh, so it's an argument about academic selection and about teaching viability uh, working better for everybody, uh, not just about grammar schools being uh, a great success. And um, the final one I wanted to uh, pick up on uh, from Joe's remarks uh, was about the uh, entry to uh, Oxford from state schools. And it's just the uh, data that the Sutton Trust published just a couple of months ago, uh, where they looked at the picture for entry uh, to all of the most selective universities in the country, uh, where they found that nearly a third of entrants to Oxbridge come from just 100 schools. 84 of them are independent schools. 14 of them are state grammar schools. The disparity is compounded, they said, by regional variation. There is only one local education authority outside the southeast of England, and that is mine, selected by Royal Trafford, which is in the top 10 for state educated pupils gaining places at either Oxbridge or any of the 30 most selected UK universities. We are providing better opportunities for children from across the ability range, and I think it's proven uh, by our results year after year and by our success 
and give people into the best chance. Well, I mean, according to the several schools in your constituency are below the floor targets that your Secretary of State set. My local authority area is fully complemented as only one school. So the problem with selective areas is you get this great division between the very, very good schools and then you get six schools at the bottom. Look at Kent. Kent gets about 55% of my local schools. There was a grammar school that failed. Well, they were my constituents. In your constituency, you held its off third recently? No. Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a wise one to, to, yes. to start. Right, I'm only last year. You're leaving the grammar, which is yes. the no, but this debate is you. And it's improving very rapidly. So you get this wide division, and so what you all, the nearly, I mean, you've got a much higher percentage of national challenge schools, for example, and they will be the new, you know, 50% of in Kent, the new <coughs> many comprehensive authorities. So what you're seeing is, is this great division between uh, demonised schools, which are full of the children who fell the 11th class, and the schools that do very well. I don't think that is part of a fair and equitable education system. I don't know how you can say if you're, all of you represent a party that claims to want to do well for poor children, <coughs> which takes about schools that take about one to two percent of children on preschool meals, which is way below the national average and way below the third average, are a way of helping poorer children. But that's why I want to see some more grammar schools in, in an urban areas where they will get to those kids. Let's let's op let's op no, let's open it up to the floor. I want the audience to yes, sir, at the back. Can I just ask? Could you stand up, please? Um, my name's Alan Beavis. I'm a town governor of the local comprehensive school. Um, I'd like to say that um, if the point of grammar schools is to help the poor and the disadvantaged children, as grammar schools become increasingly more competitive by the middle classes, who from the age of seven will have their kids tutored beyond belief, how on earth does somebody very poor compete at 11 plus. Great, how do you respond to that? Well, I mean, it, I think it is a, a real issue. Part of the reason for it is that so many grammar schools in poorer in the urban areas were closed. Most of the remaining grammar schools are in the more affluent suburbs, not in the city centres. Um, I think we should have some selective schools in the main city centres. I think that would provide real opportunity for children from poorer backgrounds and would be a, a tremendously important uh, development. Uh, but it's also something which, as you see, the numbers of grammar schools reduced, and it's particularly true of the remaining London grammar schools, you see the degree of selectivity increasing. So whereas in the borough of Trafford, we select about 35% of the ability range for, for grammar schools, you go to Barnet, the schools are so few and so oversubscribed uh, that they're taking maybe the top one or two percent becomes much, much more challenging. Yeah, uh, that's, that's, sorry, it's a bit as well. It's not the same kind of selection, but Barnum has a lot of religious um, selection. If all schools became non-selective, including the faith schools and the grammar schools, that would open up spaces to everybody in the community. But I, don't, I don't accept that because you put more grammar schools into inner cities, that's <coughs> going to open them up to poor children. No, I think people from outside the catchment areas who know how to play the system, who know how to tutor their children to answer the right questions in an exam, they were the ones who will have the advantage, not the poor and the disadvantaged. Elizabeth? Yeah, I mean, I do think there is, there is an issue, and that this one there, I agree with you on, that people are training people up more to go into grammar schools. And I think, you know, I'm concerned about the finality of the 11th plus in some cases. And there's a very interesting school in, in Elton called Crabwoods, which is a mini school which has a grammar school within the school. So it's competing with neighbouring schools in Beck. <coughs> the grammar schools are in a totally separate building from the other two schools. But you can transfer between them. So if somebody doesn't do well at the 11 plus, but then turns out to be performing really well, then they can transfer into the grammar school building on the same site. And I do think we need more solutions like that that allow more flexibility, because it's the point I was really making, making to Norman's point earlier, but I feel that if there's too much on the just a do or die decision at one stage, you kind of let teachers and students off the hook. You, we need to keep our students motivated throughout their school year. And that is why I do like other systems that say, you must pass this year, you must get on. Because realistically, we're competing with countries where the vast majority of people are leaving school at 18 with a level of equivalent feel, feel qualifications. So I think we think much more about how we're going to get to that yeah. and how we're going to get an education culture that values 
academic fair, subjects. Fair point, fair point, Ian, if you want to. Yeah, I just wanted to ask whether you, to go back to the point of the debate, which is whether you think your party would go, would stand up in a general election to tell parents the five points that I made about parent choice, about their children being failures, about dividing children across um, uh, class line. Do you realistically think well, that is that? As I said, Fiona, what, what I believe in is genuine approach to choice. I think we should have much greater diversity of provision. It should include the ability for parents to have academically selected schools, if, that, if that's children. what they want. Which and, 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 and all the evidence is that they popular, the there would be choice. Okay, more children. questions from the floor, please. Can I just ask why being more academic is because of the failure? I think being sent to secondary school schools, if you could probably too young to remember that era, but if you failed the 11th class, um, you, I mean, schools were successful schools, and if you failed the 11th class, you were going to be Well, I think if you are successful in critical academic subjects like maths, you have a massive earning premium. Like, maths A-levels gets a higher earning premium of 10%. If you're a graduate, you get a huge amount of earnings premium. But I think we're lying if you say that success in important academic subjects like science and maths doesn't deliver a career advantage, it does. Or, or, sorry, sorry, yes. Well, I think there is an important point behind this question, though, which is somehow as a society, we have no problem with the fact that there can be star sports people, and we'll put lots of resources yeah. behind us. But we have no problem there can be star actors, star musicians, and other special. But if you're a star academic, somehow you have to hide it under the cup. And I think we need to come out to the open and this, say, actually, this is academic excellence is. This is this British culture of saying being geeky is something. Ashamed of, yeah. it's cool to be a celebrity, and I think that it's a massive problem. Okay, I, mean, I, I, want, to I want to take more. There are plenty of intelligent. I want to take more questions from the floor. Do you want to go to the floor? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Not Sorry. Yes. Um, I, um, I went to comrades at school. We were the only people in the same class. Um, and would you not agree? That, actually, <laughs> would you not agree that actually this is not a debate about whether selection is good or bad? It's a debate about what kind of selection we want. Yeah. So um, my school selected people geographically, and the way the school fiddled it is they had a small pattern scale, and then they would take top-up students who, of course, happened to be the ones maybe. Well, the debate, the debate, the motion here is on academic selection, and I want to keep us to academic yeah. selection. Nick. Thanks, sir. Um, but can I just pick up on that? But we keep it to academic selection. <laughs> Actually, everybody uh, accepts there's going to be some. Form of selection. The question is at what age? And I'm not a, because I don't think I suspect even Fiona thinks universities should have some sort of academic criteria to get in within the education system as a whole. The question is about what age. I think everything Graham said suggested 11 is right, but but can we break it open a bit and say yeah. are we saying all selection is wrong or are we saying yeah, yeah, are we saying and, all selection yeah, is can, wrong? Can I can I pick Fiona up on one thing? Well, she grossly misused some data when she said that the Robbins report said that a certain proportion of people went to independent school. I've just called out the Robbins report on my iPhone. And if you look, you can only argue what Fiona is I'm not, I'm not actually making a point about on either side of the debate. You can only use the data to suggest what Fiona's saying. It, well, if you look at it, in 1961, according to the Robbins report, only 31% of women who went to Oxford and Cambridge were from independent schools. I think the figure Fiona was much higher than that. And 47% went to maintained schools. 22% went to direct grants. It may have been independent schools in the sense that they have independent government bodies, but they were publicly funded by and large for a lot of their students, about two thirds of their students, I think. Okay, but to steer back, for you, not onto the, let's steer onto the issue of what selection is. Yeah. is there this room? is a House of Commons answer, which is where I got it from. Well, so I got the chart. That's, 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 that's possibly one of the. Is, is there selection, next point, selection at any point? Is there room for it at any stage, academic well, selection? There's a complete difference between being an adult. And being a, a, I mean, we're talking about a test that's taken by many children when they're 10. Children what about 14? What about 16? What about Personally, I would say 14 is too young because I think it limits young people's choices. And I think they have to have a wide range of choices open to them and, uh, until as late as possible. I, uh, see, I think if, if all the common sense and the academic research shows that children do best taught in a peer group of similar ability children, then the question is how do you identify those children and get them into those groups? I, you know, I, again, I'm going to agree with what Elizabeth says, but I don't think necessarily a one test at the age of 11 is the only or best way of doing it. It happens to, to have been a, you know, a convenient way of doing it. I have much rather <coughs> much more flexibility, you know, where children could transfer into uh, higher streams or academic schools at different ages, 
and I think the challenge for schools is how they identify high aptitude and high motivated children from working class backgrounds who haven't had the same preparation. I mean, they shouldn't just be asking them, do they know all the hate dates of history? They should be looking for intelligence and inquiring minds, and that's a challenge for selection. Uh, but it should be much more flexible. And I think the model, you know, that Elizabeth said, uh, of having a group of schools that can have a, an academic stream within them, a grammar school within them, actually is an ideal model if we could get there. Because right. you know, right. and Elizabeth, you respond to that, and then we'll have another question. Yeah, well, I agree with what you're saying. I think one of the key points is that students should be studying a broad general core at all schools. And I think that's the big mistake we've made in Britain is we've had de facto academic selection anyway because at comprehensive schools the core subjects are not being studied and I think the you know, students in state schools should be studying subjects like history, like single sciences, like languages until they're 16. And I think it's denigrated the arguments of those who support comprehensive the fact that they haven't really been genuinely comprehensive actually. They've been focusing on less valuable subjects than the subjects that have been studied in private and grammar schools. So yeah. I think to have a common core is important, but to have an ability to be flexible about who, how you teach it and to who you teach it is, is good as well. But the, there needs to be a common core because in the, in the age of the future, we're, we're all going to need to have those abilities to think, those skills, those yeah. high level maths and sciences. Yeah. Gentlemen, I Yes, um, Jeremy Thomas, um, two quick points occur to me. Perhaps never having set foot in a British school until 18, I may claim perhaps a little neutrality in this matter. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is that this seems to be a very city based point. If we look out into the thinly populated rural areas, like Shropshire, which I know myself, or dare I say this is a north, it is often very difficult if there were to be selective schools. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, if you said that point, I'm reinforcing it. Um, the second point I would make is I wonder whether there is something very important that we are not missing here. And that is the need to emphasize family policy as much as education policy. The children, I think it has been proven, although I claim to be no expert on the subject, who are well supported by parents will have a greater likelihood of doing well in school. And so if we can have family policy and education policy working more closely together, the cross-cutting thing, then we will have children from all backgrounds with a greater chance of doing well in school and making the best of the good local schools that we have. Great. I, I agree with both those points. Uh, and the, uh, so of course family policy is important. Uh, when it comes to rural urban, the sort of point that is uh, open with, uh, absolutely accepted. I happen to have grown up in and represent uh, an urban or suburban area. Um, it works well. I've got eight state secondary schools in my very small constituency. Um, it is possible to get from any part of the constituency to any one of those schools easily. We have a, an enormous diversity of different specialisms in those schools, all of which are excellent, all doing very well. Just to too much agreement in this room. Is that going to be Jack song? <laughs> Sorry. Um, I mean, I think focusing the debate so far on grammar schools is probably missing the elephant in the room, which is academies. I mean, mm -hmm. at the moment, currently across London and Pan, uh, the schools are sort of out the local authorities as well. The schools themselves are turning into, into academies are promising to subscribe to the Pan London admissions criteria. Yes. But I'm afraid I think it's only a matter of time until some academies decide to opt out of that. And at the point I'm, I'm from Barnet, for example, which has already come up. We have 22 secondary schools, yeah. 11 of which are already academies, the other 11 I think are heading down that road. 90 primary schools, I think the director of the children's services is on the phone to each one saying, do you want to be called an academy? <coughs> My concern is that as academies opt out with the admissions criteria and perhaps go down the road of selection, we've got an even bigger problem and an even bigger issue than deciding whether or not we should bring back uh, primary schools. This isn't that going to happen with the government's academies programme, do you think? Well, I think that the diversity of provision is an important point, and I think that the issue with the way that selection you know, worked and might have worked on the 11 plus is that you have schools that are, if you like, the remainder of the schools, and that may not be the case traffic. Whereas I think the academies, every school will have a special purpose. And I point you to this idea of the separate free school, which is offering a special education to those who have learning disabilities. And I think that's 
that's great and you do need that diverse provision. But yes, in a small town like down the market, there is only a critical mass of one school. But what the schools in my area are doing is they're actually linking their sick forms so that they can teach key subjects and move the teachers between the schools. So there are lots of different solutions that can be found. But I don't think historically there's been the motivation for the schools to up their game. And that's why I support increased competition okay. between the schools rather than necessarily increasing the competition. Uh, can I just put a point to Fiona on the... the very quickly, she the same side of the house. <laughs> I, I think this is a point about what goes on within comprehensive schools. I mean, do, do, do you think that the way that the way that sort of academic subjects have been removed from some of the comprehensive schools is a problem, or do you support that? Well, I mean, there are many comprehensive schools that still teach a very broad curriculum, including core academic subjects, and they give a wide range of choices. And I would prefer that to be the case. But actually, it's the academies that have been graded the curriculum faster and more, more frequently than any other school because they've been given the free. Well, we're, we're, we're getting into we're getting into the calories to begin. Edith it, Barr. I'm a good friend here. I'm a special needs teacher. And if I could just sort of say two things. One was the question of the 11 plus and why it was so hated. And I'm not sure if the younger people here realise that at the age of 11, when you went to a secondary model, you were then not allowed to write O-levels. Mm -hmm. And it was only the end of the 60s yeah. where the headmaster insisted on in putting his kids in against the current medical advice that they would all have nervous breakdowns. Mm -hmm. That this idea, so at 11, your chances of university were killed off. Um, now, I just wanted to say on the special needs thing, what is happening is that huge numbers of kids <coughs> are now coming into school without basic language skills. The government is cutting, whether it's government or LEAs, I'm not sure, but the borough I work in has cut the um, speech and language therapists. There's been a fight to get somebody half a day a week for children who desperately need help. Now, if you've got money and you're in the private system, mm -hmm. the problems get solved when you're that size. Mm -hmm. And so th I think that the problem with the comprehensives is not so much as what is happening at 11 mm -hmm. as what is happening at 5, 6, 7. And Finland, you know, which has fantastic results. If you actually look at it, you can say there are lots of arguments about homogeneity in the um, population and all the rest of it. But according to one of the educators there I met, he said their key thing was, um, and I'm afraid I don't remember how many years ago, was putting in proper special needs provision in every single school in the sense of uh, people who were there. And as soon as a problem arose, the specialist went in and solved it. In this country, you so, have to... So selection is, in there, is, is irrelevant, it's not... Exactly. Uh, but because the problem is solved when it arises. Whereas what happens in this country is the schools have to battle for two years before you can apply for a statement. Again, if you don't have money, if you're in the state schools, um, just because of the way the provision goes, and I won't spend time telling you why, but I'm thinking of one child who wait, has waited four years for, to see a statement. And somebody said if she were unruly and hurled a chair through a window, they would see her tomorrow. Thank you, thank you. Well, I just, I mean, that does make the point that it's very, very, as David Willits pointed out, it would be very difficult for some children to pass a selective test at 11 if their early years they haven't been given the support or they haven't had the access that some other families can afford to give to their children to help them get to the point where they pass the test. This is a very discriminatory test. Like Graham, how do, you, what, how do you think about that? Well, um, the children should be given that support. They should be given that education in primary school. And I think uh, one of the problems with today is, is we, we end up going back to excuses for underperformance uh, lower down uh, in uh, school in the early years. Uh, actually, one of the reasons I suspect why <coughs> primary schools in my constituency are very good and always have been is they've always been held up to uh, a bit of an informal market and had a, bit, a little bit of competition. But I also wanted to comment on the first point that the lady made because I think one of the problems with this debate is always that it is partly argued in the past. Uh, for so many people, their experience of the selective system is what used to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I do accept uh, that one of the reasons why selection is unpopular in some places is a lot of second modern schools were not good schools. And there were two possible responses to that. One was to get rid of the grammar schools and the secondary moderns and turn comprehensive. The other was to keep the very good grammar schools and raise the standards of the secondary moderns. Typically, in those areas which are still selective, that's what we've done. That's why the system is 
hugely popular, not just with grammar school. It's popular in my area across the board. But by your government's own standards, huge charter schools in Kent, which is the biggest selective authority in the country, are failing. I think you know, Fiona, I'd like to change my government's education. But, but that is a selective authority. Those schools are the lower the floor size. They're second in the country. Well, some of you are now a lot of fighting. No, 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 this is an entirely unfair point. Because there is, there is a problem for some high schools or state models. If you compare them, you can, if you compare them to all ability comprehensive schools. They have a skewed intake they don't have the top end, or Blackwell said it's necessary. Exactly. So it's hard for them to make the same. So you need to end selection, and then those schools will be able to raise their standards. They, they, they've got all the obstacles. There may be, as you commented earlier, their value add is actually better than the comprehensive. Oh, Leading to the back. Let's oh, that, 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 get some more questions in. Leading to the back. I'm, I'm Margaret Tullock from Comprehensive Future, which campaigns for selection, so obviously I won't come from one side of the debate. But I wanted to take up Lord Blackwell on his, he seems to be very keen to separate out children that are highly motivated. I, I really think you should talk to head teachers in areas of, of selection, the head teachers of schools that are non-selective, who take the children in who have failed the 11 plus, because they have a huge job trying to restore confidence in those children, and they, they Failing the 11 plus is, doesn't do much for your motivation, and that we're talking about the majority of children. You talk about ladders, of ladders. I, I think in the 21st century we have to have an education system that does well by all its children and doesn't set up escape routes for a few, which is what you seem to want to talk about. A couple of points with Graham Brady. Um, you talked about Fiona and her myths. Um, I think you have to watch a little bit in your myths because you, you're very keen on comparing local education authorities with local education authorities. The, the department's own statistics, I think it was 2009 statistical bulletin, show clearly that in selective local authorities what they do is they export children after key stage two who are less able and they import children from non-selected areas. You're, you're shaking your head, you really do need to look at that statistical bulletin because the figures are there. So if you compare local authorities with local authorities, you're comparing a selective local authority which has creamed off able children into it and exported children who may not do as well. So you, you really have to look at the data. And we can argue all sorts of things about whether mixed ability produces better results. What is clear is if you have a good teacher, they'll make a good system, any system work. And essentially what we have to talk about is, is good, how we get good teachers. And lastly, Ripon. I was very involved in the campaign in Ripon. I think you skated over a little bit. It's not, you shouldn't use this as an example that parents want to keep grammar schools. What it was an example for is a dreadful balloting system, which meant that uh, parents, of children who par parents of children who were in prep schools 10 miles away got the vote, and parents of children next door in primary schools next door to the grammar schools didn't because of the way the balloting arrangements. So don't, please don't use Ripon as an example no. that parents want, no, like, want grammar schools. Like, can, can I just pick up that point about motivation? I made the point that it's, motivation is important as well as pure aptitude because if children are going to succeed in taking bargains, they not only need to have the ability, they need to want to do it, be motivated to do it. Now, you take a bright child from a deprived city's area and you stick him in a sink local comprehensive school. Why is he there all sinks? Why is he there all sinks schools? His, his motivation is excellent comprehensive school in the area. Can I ask you a question? Uh, there, are, there are some excellent, but there are also some that are not so excellent. But we should be aiming at getting them all excellent. We should be aiming to get them all excellent. But if you take that child and put him in a class where he is the only child of high ability, where he is ridiculed by all his workmates, for, for wanting to do his homework, where he's bullied for being bright, for being a nerd, where he is treated you know, as a social outcast, his motivation is zero. If you take that same kid and say, actually, you have the potential to reach the top, you have the potential to be a leader of this country, we're going to put you with a peer group of people who are bright like you and motivated, his motivation will go to the top. Now that's what I want for the, every child to be able to be part of a motivated group who aspire to be the best. And part of what people, many people in this room, I think, probably don't understand is how much difference it makes to people's confidence and aspirations to be taken, to have the opportunity to move into a peer group where they are mixing with a completely mixed ability group, people from whole different backgrounds, and feel an equal of people who come from different parts of society because they're there on merit, they're there because they're able, they're valued, 
they're treated as people who can reach the top. That's the way you get people lacking. So how do you explain motivation in Finnish schools where there's no selection, no segregation, but great teaching, and a society which is completely uh, capitalist but egalitarian. This is not a socialist country. There is no segregation there. Every child, every single child in every town, city and village in Finland has access to a good school staffed by excellent teachers, highly trained and highly motivated. And do they stream in those schools? I don't know if they stream, but streaming is not the same as selection. We've established this. This is not the same as selection. Your argument about peer groups, about peer groups and single schools, these arguments only exist because there is selection. It's not very controversial, I'm afraid, but I just wonder if the future and the actual solution is in the middle, in that there's a distinction between a comprehensive school and a comprehensive system, exactly, which is what Elizabeth's been driving at. And I'd be interested to know whether Fiona and the lady who spoke very eloquently before about Ripon, um, how you feel about um, the kind of um, in, implicit selection we're going to get with UTCs at 14, whereby children select to go to a more vocational school, or their parents select to send them to the likes of the school that's been talked about in Thetford. And it's not the school selecting, but it's parents choosing to send and individuals choosing to go to those types of schools. Actually, is that a consensus that both sides of the side of might agree on? I, I think anything that allows people to have the choice, the broadest choice possible, available to everybody, is a good thing. Selection narrows people's choices. So that ruins like UTCs, that ruins like these new UTCs. Well, not, are they selective? Are you yeah. Well, they, will, they might be selective, well, selective if the demand. Well, I, I think that's a shame if they're going to be selective. If the demand is there, you're going to have to use something. Well, I think Daniel that's a shame. Bag, that limits choice? I was actually going to bring up UTCs in my point. I think a lot of, the, you know, taking apart what the Baker Deering Trust say, and actually, I mean, I talked to a lot of the sponsors and a lot of the head teachers who were interested in setting up amongst the first wave and the second wave of UTCs that will come through. And most of them talk about, you, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of kids are, what Lord Baker says is, 11 is too early, 16 <coughs> is too late, 14 is probably the right age for if you're going to have a selective system, and I, I don't necessarily say it's desirable, but I think it's inevitable that we will move back to a greater degree as the diversity of provision comes through. I think a greater degree of testing to get into certain channels, particularly a high quality technical education route in our 14 to 19 system. I really do think that if you're going to have this, you've got to have the kids who've not only got the right aptitude, but actually the right ability in terms of English and maths to do really complex technical routes. And particularly with the UTCs, they are setting for a really high bar. And actually, to bring it back, it's about the academic ability in terms of the English and maths in order to achieve that, and to follow that route, and to take that really big step of actually saying, we're going to follow an engineering diploma, English and maths, and sciences at 14. I think you need to have selection back if you're going to have that in the system. You need to have that, that the ability to select by ability for schools that are going to offer a different path to the normal, to the normal room. Why does that affect the, the, the side of the house? Why does that affect? Well, I think, I mean, one thing that the schools has to make clear is that UTCs will do the English baccalaureate, so they will be high quality schools. I, I favour widening that across the whole system. I think the lady at the front's absolutely right that the, the issue with the way that the 11 plus have been set up in the past is the local authority makes the decision and you're either in one camp or the other. And I think that can be quite you know, debilitating if you, if you fall the wrong side of the line. If it's each school making <coughs> the decision based on the aptitudes of the student in special cases, then that's a lot more of a two-way process between the student and the school. It's less about your failure, it's more about whether you're suitable for this particular type of education or whether you go into a general stream. Um, and I think that will help address the motivation deficit. There's a massive motivation deficit in this country. I mean, people, I, I found the whole debate about the EMA quite extraordinary. I mean, 16 to 18 year olds already get free education. In some other countries in the world, people are desperate to take up that offer. And yet here, there's a sort of attitude that we need to try and you know, encourage people to do it more. I mean, this is this is a, education is a great thing. You know, it transforms your your, your life ability. I think uh, people, I, people I, need to believe in it. Can I take two final questions?
gentleman here. Um, just on the just on the rhetoric from, from the proposition side, um, in terms of what um, life is like for children in comprehensive schools. Um, I teach in a comprehensive academy in Brent. Um, there's four teachers here who teach that have taught in comprehensive schools. Some of the most challenging in London. Um, and on the question of motivation, um, I think it's actually quite offensive and, and, and somewhat outrageous to suggest that children in these schools are uh, people who are bright or being pilloried and ridiculed. It's none of our experience. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I just don't know quite on what basis those, those but points. But Brent is a very, very good borough. Brent is a very, very good borough. So I think, I think that's our south branch, right? Um, so I think that, <laughs> well, there's a, there's a <laughs> point to start. <laughs> so <there's laughs> right. so oh, carry on, carry on. Just without being interrupted, there's a big difference between south branch and north branch in terms of education and achievement. Um, I think generally in terms of motivating teachers, the rhetoric that we're getting from the Conservative government at the moment is that we're working in these schools which are just nightmares and jungles and awful. Mm -hmm. It's not our experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of motivating teachers that are raising motivation of children who come into these schools from demotivated de families, it's not, it's not a thing I've any good at all. Graham, what do you think? I've never really raised any good at school. Um, there are good companies. Yeah, it wasn't you I know I've visited a great many of them. My, uh, disability in this debate is that I happen to have been educated in and now represent an area which has an extraordinarily good education system uh, which works very well for the benefit of children in all of the schools, be they grammar schools and high schools, and that is inevitably the prism through which I see it. Uh, what I do uh, look at, however, is a comparison between the overall performance of selected areas and comprehensive areas, and we have so much evidence now that overall Selected oh, areas perform oh, uh, perform uh, better. <laughs> um, well, I'm glad Fiona's moved. I'll try to suggest that the Borough of Trafford doesn't uh, achieve for the people. But, 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 the, but the, the, the key term that's picked up on uh, Margaret's task is about motivation. Yeah. Um, and I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation. And I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation. And I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation. And I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation. And I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation. And I think that the key term that's picked up on Margaret's task is about motivation where state schools aren't achieving what they should be is a very big flow out of the state sector into independent education. We have in my area a very, and I have a uh, constituency which is very mixed, but I've got some very affluent parts of it, but a very low level of independent education uh, because parents are very happy to be a part of the state sector. And I don't know the figures from Brent, which is probably good news, uh, but if you look at the borough of uh, Camden, 25% uh, of people go to independent schools in Camden. That's crazy, they shouldn't feel they have to. But I'm sure you're, you're teaching in a very good school, and I'm delighted you are. Final question. Anyone like their Actually. final question? <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, I just want to make a statement about the I think mean, he's been going on tonight about streaming and things like that. But I, I've got a feeling that the latest states suggest that uh, it's to do with the teacher. That if the teacher agrees with streaming, then the streaming classes will do well. But if the teachers agree with mixed ability, then the mixed ability classes will do well. I'm not feeling that's the latest thing that's come out. So I kind of disagree with that. A lot of it comes down to the teacher. I also find it fascinating when this just talks about choice mm -hmm. and about um, parental choice, but then it doesn't actually want to give choice to any students within the school. Uh, the way they narrow the kind of curriculum that they're talking about. It was interesting listening to Steve Jobs um, the other day talking about how he dropped out of college and went to a calligraphy course and then couldn't understand why he wanted to do calligraphy. And then 10 years down the line, he could dot, join the dots backwards to understand why that might help him in life. So have the arrogance to predict the future, to say these are the subjects that you need, you know, to, to show that, I think is kind of outrageous. And that's something like media studies. We have people studying media studies. We might not have people kind of exposing the Rupert Murdoch of this world. Anyone more, but I want more back up to respond just on the initial point. Yes, uh, I mean, I, I have never, I, can I just say, you know, I'm fully um, with Graham saying there are some fantastic comprehensive schools, and I've been around a number of them, you know, and I take my hats off to the teachers who make those work and succeed. And I'm certainly not advocating that nobody should ever go to a comprehensive school. If there was a fantastic comprehensive school in my area, I'd be very happy to send my kids there. But not every school manages to achieve those standards. And, and there are a lot of children, even in those uh, relatively high caliber areas, high caliber schools, who nevertheless would achieve more 
I think the evidence suggests, if they uh, were in a peer group of high ability children who could be taken further and faster by a teacher who was able to work with them. Now the evidence uh, you know, points in all kinds of directions. I know you can always make the figures <coughs> look at. The reason I tend to believe the evidence that I quoted that suggests that children in a, a critical mass of 20 children of the top ability range, I'm not talking about in an average, but the top ability range, uh, tend to do better if they're taught in that way, is A, it accords with common sense, uh, but B, you know, all the evidence I've seen suggests that those children do do significantly better than children who are taught in a mixed ability or uh, in a small ability. Right, I'm going to ask Fiona to come in quickly now, and then I'm going to ask Liz because there's been a direct point put to Liz. It's not directly on the thing on the, the I, I just, I've got to come back on it. You keep using the evidence. The evidence is that countries that do not segregate their children have higher, out, better outcomes and higher equity. That is categorically there, all the evidence, all the countries the Secretary of State holds up, your Secretary of State holds up as shiny examples of what we should be doing, are countries that do not segregate children, and especially don't segregate at the age of 10 or 10. It's simply untrue to say this is good education, it is not. Please. I just want to, you know, I, I have a GCSE in media studies, and I can tell you, it told me nothing about interrogating Rupert Murdoch or anything else. Um, you know, the idea that we should just have a free for all, and essentially, um, you know, I think fair enough if it's outside the state system, but we do have a, a state education system. We, we say that we think primary school students should study maths and English. You know, if a child decided they wanted to play in the morning, the teacher would say no. You know, why is it we allow students to cut off options early before they necessarily know about the workplace? I think the, the evidence is that all the most successful countries in education do lay out a core of basic academic knowledge, which then gives people the ability to think and learn and succeed in any future career. And I think that's what we're not doing for students in Britain. If you look at what private schools are doing, and the fact they're doing twice as many of those academic subjects, and seven times as few of subjects like media studies, I think that gives a clear indication of what is really valuable. Um, I, just, I, just, I just want to respond to this other point earlier. Um, saying that all our schools are great. Well, we're 28th in the world for mathematics, even though we're the sixth richest country. We're 25th in the world for reading. You know, something is wrong here. And this, I don't like the complacency. I don't like the complacency here of saying, oh, everything's fine. I teach in a great school. Well, it, you may teach in a great school, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's true. But I've been in schools with 23% uh, achieving a GCSE and there is something wrong at the moment with our system that's been allowing that to happen for years and years and years. You know, we have 40% of people in this country who don't have a basic level of skill. It's 34% in the US, it's 28% in France, it's 22% in Germany. You know, in the PISA League tables, we perform worse than the state of because Texas. We're very we perform worse than the state of Texas. And is that the because we're a segregated system? Because we're a segregated system? No, it's not because we're a segregated system. It's because we have, we have a system an attitude, as expressed by that gentleman over there, that somehow doing these other, you know, some core academic subjects don't really have the worth. And let's, and let's, well, and let's, let's come back, let's, let's, let, 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 let's, let's come back, let's, let's, let's come back to the motion, let's, let's vote on the motion, so if you have changed your mind, do you still think that a return to academic selection in schools is inevitable? If you think so, hold up your freedom of form side. Well, I think on the basis that there are a few more reds and the fact that there are more reds now than there were at the beginning, it seems as if that side of the house have maybe kept the balance, but it's pretty even for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for coming along. Please do stay. Absolutely.